many of us have been through the fires, we've been through the dark nights, and yet we know that the only reason that we can stand here today is because of your goodness. Because you have been faithful. You have walked with us through those things, those difficult battles in life. Some of us are going through some pretty dark battles right now. And we hang on to one thing and one thing only, that you are good, that you are faithful, and that your goodness will run after us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So Lord, as we open up the pages of your scriptures, we pray once again that you would reveal your goodness to us to give us faith and hope and strength for a new day. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you guys very much. Got me a little emotional on that last one there. All right, before we get going, just want to remind all of you that we have quite a few of our people not here this morning. They are at uh, church camp, Mid-South Camp, which is uh, our little region of churches that gathers together and pastors and volunteers, the camp is uh, try to keep it very affordable for people because camp gets expensive real fast. Uh, so most of, the, most of the people running the camp are volunteers. But it still costs money, and a lot of you actually gave money to help uh, families out to send kids. And the reason why we do this is because uh, church camp can be a very formative experience for kids. They often really encounter God in some powerful ways, sometimes in some very new ways. And so it really is um, uh, worthwhile to, to do this once a year. So we have more kids going than I think we've ever had go. We have, uh, your name's up there. Are you supposed to be there right now? You're not supposed to be up there? That's wrong up there? Oh, you're going later today. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah, so Omar, I saw Omar, and I thought the camp started today, and Omar's name is... A silt is, a, is somewhere between a counselor and a camper. You're a counselor in leadership training, right? Yeah. And then we have uh, several of our, our young people, our, our high school students, and then um, Nora is actually uh, an employee here, and she's actually one of the ones that helps run the camp. So they are away, and if um, uh, you're like, well, that's great. What does it have to do with me? But you can still participate in, in blessing them, we, in the back, back there on the table, we have some little um, wristbands with the name, one of the names of the people up there. And you, at the end of the service, go and, and pick uh, one up, and then it'll remind you to pray for them every day so you can uh, be a part of what God is doing through prayer. So I will try to remember at the end of the service to tell you to, to, to pick one up. Uh, hopefully, if I don't remember, one of you will shout out and remind me. So anyway, okay, that's enough of that. Let's go to the Bible. Let's talk about the scriptures and what they have to say to us. Before we get started, though, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the qualities that we most admire in human beings is when we think that they are wise. You know, wise people are very valuable to us. And you know, you start to think about, well, who do I think is a wise person? You know, when, when, when that phrase, wise person, pops up, who pops up into your head? And maybe it's one of the great scientists that reveals the secrets of the universe. There's old Albert. Everybody pretty much recognizes one scientist, and it's Albert there, uh, Albert Einstein. So maybe that's who you think of when you think of wisdom, or maybe it's one of the great sages of the past, like Confucius or somebody, um, sharing us the timeless wisdom of the ages. Or maybe you think of a, a great artist, you know, one of the wise artists of our time is Maya Angelou. Uh, one of my favorite Maya Angelou quotes is, um, when somebody reveals to you who they are, Believe them the first time. Isn't that great? Or maybe you're a more practical person, and when you think of a wise person, you think of somebody that maybe has some financial success. And so maybe you think of somebody like Warren Buffett, the Oracle of Omaha up there, who uh, 
has made a lot of money with his investing strategies and is happy to share his wisdom with, with all of us. So uh, wise people are very valued because we think that if we listen to them, our lives might get better. Let me ask you another question. Talking about wise people, what exactly is wisdom? If you had to define wisdom, how would you define it? Lack of stupidity, it's kind of a negative way to put it, John. (laughs) Just try not to be an idiot. (laughs) All right, well... uh, you know, sometimes if you go back and you, you look at the dictionary, the English dictionaries, and I, I, which I did. You know, what is wisdom? And some of them equated it with intelligence or knowledge or insight. And, you know, I started to think about that. And I'm like, you know, that's not really right, you know, because we, we think of knowledge and intelligence and wisdom as really three different things. Intelligence is sort of just raw brain power, the ability to think and calculate and Knowledge is the information that you have, and wisdom is really something different, isn't it? Wisdom is really, yeah, it's connected to experience, but it's more than that. It's like, how do you apply your intelligence and knowledge and experience to situations? Um, It's really about how you use it. Uh, The Cambridge Dictionary defines wisdom as being the ability to use your knowledge and experience to make good decisions and judgments. And I was like, that, that sounds pretty good, right? Because have you ever known somebody that was really smart but just keep, kept doing stupid things? Like, they, they had, what did you, you're living that dream right now. You're a smart guy, but you pipe up in church. Yeah, no, it's good. His wife raised her hand when he, were you testifying? Yes, he's very smart. Okay, all right. Yeah, we've known people that maybe they weren't like Albert Einstein level of intelligence, but they just seem to make good decision after good decision. You know, it's the difference between intelligence and wisdom. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that I think I would define wisdom is it's knowing what to do and when to do it, right? All right. So you didn't come here to hear my definition of wisdom. You came here so that God could speak through his word to us and tell us his definition of wisdom. So what does the Bible say about wisdom? Actually, a lot. Wisdom is mentioned I don't know, over a hundred times in the Bible, and it's held up as something very precious. For instance, in Proverbs 8, 11, we read, for wisdom is far more valuable than rubies. Nothing you desire compares with it. You know, that's written on the side of, I think it's Pat Neff Hall, at the university that Judith and I went. It's right there on the side that wisdom is more valuable than rubies. Now, I would never try to convince your grandmother of that. She kind of likes jewelry, so. Um, but wisdom is, I'm gonna, what I just did was not wise. Because <laughs> she's supposed to feed me lunch later. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get in trouble. Um, but uh, the Bible says that wisdom is very valuable, but how does the Bible define what wisdom is? And for that, I think we need to look at a person in the Bible that's usually identified with wisdom, uh, somebody from the Old Testament. It may be those of you who are kind of Bible people. When I said, who do you think of when you think of wisdom? You might have mentioned that person who, okay, I hear it all over the place, Solomon. Now, who was Solomon? Okay, he was a king. He was the actual uh, son of King David, David being sort of the the, the greatest king that Israel had, and you think, you know, being David's son might not be the greatest gig because you're always going to be in his shadow. But Solomon uh, often was considered to be one of the great kings of, of Israel as well. He, he did pretty well, at least for the first half. He kind of had a, kind of went downhill in the second half of his life. But in the beginning, he really does kind of personify what biblical wisdom is all about. So in order to understand what the Bible thinks is wise, so that we can be wise. Let's look at one of the stories uh, 
about Solomon. This is actually early in his rule and reign as king. This is in chapter 3 of 1 Kings. So if you like to find things in your Bible, you've got about three seconds before I get going here. Chapter 3, 1 Kings, beginning in verse 3. Listen now to the word of God. Solomon loved the Lord and followed all the decrees of his father David, except that Solomon, too, offered sacrifices and burned incense at the local places of worship. The most important of these places of worship was at Gibeon. So the king went there and sacrificed 1,000 burnt offerings. That night, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream. And, and God said, what do you want? Ask, and I will give it to you. Solomon replied, you, have show, you showed great and faithful love to your servant my father, David, because he was honest and true and faithful to you. And you have continued to show this great and faithful love to him today by giving him a son to sit on his throne. Now, O Lord, my God, you have made me king instead of my father, David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted, Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. So God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart so that as no one else has had or will ever have. And I will give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And if you follow me and obey my decrees and commands as your father David did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon woke up and realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Lord's Covenant where he sacrificed burnt offerings and peace offerings. And then he invited all his officials to a great banquet. All right. So there's always more in the passage that we can talk about. We have to focus on one or two little things. And what I want to focus on with you this morning is as we try to figure out what wisdom is, let's hone in on what exactly was Solomon asking for. Now, the New Living Translation, in verse 9, Solomon asks, give me an understanding heart. Now, if you have got uh, the NIV, the New International Version, which is very popular, and you might have it in front of you, that one says, give me a discerning heart. You look at other English translations, sometimes they'll translate them, give me an understanding mind or a discerning mind. The thing of it is, none of these are exactly what the Hebrew, the original Hebrew says. And the original Hebrew is very interesting because what Solomon actually asked for, he said, give me a listening isn't that interesting? Wisdom is a listening heart. Now that's very, to me, that changes things because if I think of an understanding heart, it just kind of changes. Because when we think of wisdom, we think of, well, this is what I have and this is what I know. And I can take my intelligence and my experience and my in insight and my knowledge and I can apply it to this situation in a way so that I will know what I need to do. It's very I, I, I. It's about what I have. But if wisdom is about a listening heart, it's about me realizing what I don't have. It's about me realizing that I don't have all the answers and I need to be listening to someone who does. And obviously from the context, 
the person that Solomon is supposed to be listening to in order to have wisdom is God. Now, this whole thing, this whole idea of wisdom being a listening heart ties back into something that we actually talked about last week. I know not all of you were here last week, and every one of you has slept since last week, so you might not remember everything that I said. Um, but one of the themes that we talked about last week is what is, why did God create human beings in the first place? What's our purpose? And we went back to Genesis chapter 1 where it says, uh, God says, let us make human beings in our image. And we talked about kind of what that meant that, uh, and being in relationship with God and reflecting who he is into the world. But, but then in Genesis 1, it also says that not only did he make us in his image, but he made us to rule and reign over his creation. And that God, as the king of the world, means to use human beings to, 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 to work through us, to give us responsibility and authority, and then God would, through us, bless and fill this world with goodness and beauty and blessing. That that's our role. But in order to do what God wants us to do, we have to be willing to listen to what he wants. And of course, the Genesis story, very quickly, human beings decide, well, we don't want to listen to what God wants. We want to do things for ourselves. We want to be our own gods. We don't want to do what God wants. We want to do what we want. Right? That's the whole story of Genesis chapter 3. But even though things go off the rails, that doesn't mean that God has given up on human beings, which is, of course, the rest of the story of the Bible. But understand that God still wants to work through human beings. He still gives us responsibility and authority so that he can work through us. Now, that's what's going on with King Solomon. He knows that God has given him responsibility and authority over the entire kingdom. And you say, well, okay, but how is this relevant to me because I'm not a king? But understand that each one of us has a kingdom because each one of us has a little bit of authority and a little bit of responsibility over something. Now, you know, some people have entire kingdoms, entire countries to rule over. When they listen to God, things go well, and when they don't listen to God, they make people miserable around them. But that's pretty much true at every level of authority and responsibility. Do you ever have a boss that was just a really good boss and it was just a blessing to work for that boss? Do you ever have a boss that was not a good boss? That one gets the amen. Aren't you a supervisor, though? <laughs> but if you've ever had a, a bad boss, it's like a bad king. A bad king makes everybody, God can't use them to bless everybody. Or God, you know, they, 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 they make everybody miserable. And Every person in here has an area. Of, now, if you are a supervisor, then you have some authority to bless all kinds of people. If you're a parent, you've got a child or two that you either bless or don't bless. But even if you're an employee, even if you're a child, you still have, you still have authority and responsibility over your actions, over your life, over your decisions, and you still bless the people around you or make them miserable with how you behave. And we all need wisdom. We all need a listening heart so that God can guide us and bless others through us. Now the question then becomes, well, how do you get a listening heart? What does that even mean? Um, and there are a couple of things you have to do in order to have a listening heart. And the, the very first step is the one that Solomon exhibits when he talks about being a little child. Put that verse up there. He says, you've made me king, but I'm like a little child. Now, he doesn't mean that literally. He doesn't mean that he's, you know, seven years old. He's an adult. What does he mean when he says he's like a little child? It means he knows that he doesn't know everything. 
You remember what Jesus said, you know, Jesus talking to his disciples, and, you know, his disciples had a tendency to think that they knew everything and would even tell Jesus what they thought that they should be doing. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and stop being idiots, I didn't say it quite that way, but unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never even get into the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to become like a little child? What does that mean? Well, he says it in the very next verse. He says, whoa, no, no, go back. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, it's really hard to have a listening heart when you think you know everything already. Because you're not going to listen to anybody. And the thing about a little child, and we're talking about a really, they know that they don't know everything. They know that they need help. It's only when we get older that we think, well, I, you know, we have a ministry here that um, provides meals for people going through a particular crisis. And what we tell people is don't, when, you, when you're trying to figure out if a family needs a meal, don't ever go to them and say, do you need a meal? Because what will they say? They'll say no. And often they'll say it because, you know, they don't want to be a bother. They don't want to be an imposition. They don't want to be trouble for anybody else. But a lot of times we, we, we don't want to admit we need anything because we don't want to look weak. We don't want to look like we don't have it all together ourselves. And in order to receive God's guidance, we have to admit, I don't know it all. Humility, you know, there's a, there's a line in the Bible um, it's, it's actually said in more than one place. And the line goes like this, that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Now think about that. What's it saying? It's saying God actually fights against those who are proud. Now, you know, on one hand, proud people can be really annoying. You know, you think you know everything. You know, you just want to slap them across the face. And you think, well, that's what God's saying here. It's like, don't annoy me so much by being conceited that I slap you across the face. But that's not really the point. Remember, this whole deal about wisdom is about knowing how God wants us to behave. It's about knowing, it's about listening to God so he can guide us to do the things that God wants us to do so God's blessing can flow through us. Well, if I'm not listening to God, if I'm so proud, I'm like, I'm going to do it my way. Well, then I'm not doing it God's way. I'm actually working against... It's not so much that God opposes me. It's that I'm opposing God. Which seems like a really dumb thing to do in the long run. Given who God is and who we are. But the idea there is the first step to a listening heart is the humility that says, I need God's guidance in how to live my life to do the things to take care of the responsibilities that I have so that I can be a blessing to others. So humility is important. But, you know, even if you have that humility, how do you hear from God? Would you, would you all like a sermon series on how to hear from God? That's a, that'd be good, wouldn't it? I better work some on that because, believe it or not, I don't have all the answers to that. Maybe I might need some wisdom and guidance too, right? All right. Well, in order, you know, he, he exhibit, Solomon exhibits humility. How is he going to hear from God? So let's go back to Solomon. And, and in fact, let's go back to before Solomon. Let's go all the way back to Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, Moses, this is before there even are kings in Israel. There aren't any kings in Israel yet. And Moses is giving instructions to the people of Israel. They're getting ready to go into the promised land. He's telling them, He's giving them God's instructions. And he's going to instruct them on what to do when they have a king. And this is what Moses, or God through Moses, says. He says, you're about to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you take it over and settle there, you may think, we should select a king to rule over us like the other nations around us. If this happens, and it does, be sure to select as king the man that the Lord your God chooses. You must appoint a fellow Israelite. He must not be a foreigner. The king, and then he's going to go on to describe things that all the kings freaking do. 
that they shouldn't do. It's just behavior that kings tend to do. He says, the king must not build up for himself large stables of horses or send his people to Egypt to buy horses, for the Lord has told you, you must never return to Egypt. The king must not take many wives for himself because they will turn his heart away from the Lord. Now, if you know anything about the life of Solomon, you know that's exactly what happens. He marries these women, and these women are like, we want to worship the gods of our ancestors, and Solomon later goes on to do it, but that's not where we are in the story. But let me just say, be careful who you marry, because they may lead you away from the right God. <laughs> okay, that has nothing to do with him. He must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. You know, these are all things that kings tend to do. And then he goes on to say what the king should do. And let's go ahead and say, let's go ahead and read still in Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. It says, when he sits on the throne as king, he must copy for himself this body of instruction on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. He must always keep that copy with him and read it daily as long as he lives. This way he will learn to fear the Lord his God by obeying all the terms of these instructions and decrees. This regular reading will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens. It will also prevent him from turning away from these commands in the slightest way, and it will ensure that he and his descendants reign for many generations in Israel. Now, this was written long before the printing press made books affordable, easy to read, long before everybody could read. This was back in the time when if you wanted a copy of the scriptures, you actually had to have somebody write the whole thing out by hand. So for most people, the Bible was something that maybe the village had and they would gather once a week and somebody would read it to them, much in the same way we're doing it right now. Very few people had their own personal copy of the scripture. But the instructions to the king is you have the resources. So you have a copy of the scriptures made so that you have all of the words of God and you read from it, not each week, but each day. And as you read it, God will speak to you and give you the wisdom that you need so that you can be a blessing to your kingdom. You can rule your kingdom and God can bless all of the things under your responsibility. Now, I think it's also very interesting that humility is mentioned here. Now, you have to have humility in order to read the scriptures because you're like, okay, I don't have all the answers and I need God, so I'm going to read the scriptures. But he also says, if you read the scriptures, it will reinforce your humility because the scriptures basically say about how God loves all of us, cares for all of us, that no one of us is really above each other. And that we're all under God's, we're all sinners, that we're all, the, the king is really no better than anybody else. Now, if you know what happens when people get in positions of power, often they become really conceited and they do start to think that they are better than everybody else and then they mistreat the people around them. And that's, you know, can be true of your boss at work, it can be true of your pastor, can be true of the popular kids at school. You know, a lot of times kids are popular at school because they're really great people, but sometimes kids get popular at school and it's a kind of power and then they become conceited and then they're just not really much fun to be around. I'm not looking at anybody over here. <laughs> but the idea of humility being not only necessary in order to hear from God, but also reinforced when we listen to God, I think is, is kind of important for understanding what wisdom is. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's the case. Those of you who know the Bible, you've read First and Second Kings and those stories. Did the kings, by and large, did, did they do these things? No, they were terrible. Most of the kings were terrible. Now, there were some good kings. You know, there was a guy by the name of Josiah who was a good king. There was a guy by the name of Hezekiah. And what does it say about Hezekiah in 2 Kings? It says, Hezekiah trusted in the Lord 
the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything, and he carefully obeyed all the commands that the Lord had given him. In other words, he had a listening heart. He listened to the Lord, and he followed the Lord's instructions. And because of that, God was able to bless the entire kingdom because Hezekiah had wisdom. So the Lord was with him, and Hezekiah was successful in everything that he did. Now, that was true of two or three, four kings, but most of them, most of them were trash, okay? Most of the kings were terrible. Most of the kings did all the stuff they weren't supposed to do. They relied on their own wisdom. And when they were confronted with the word of God, and God says, hey, look, you're not doing the right thing here, they didn't listen. They didn't humble themselves. In fact, there's this one story, which is just striking to me. It's so striking to me that I want to share it with you. It's, it's one of the very last kings uh, in, in Israel, and things are bad, and he's not listening to anything God wants to do, and he's just pursuing his own foolish course. And one of the prophets actually writes down God's word for him and, and delivers it. It's not safe for him to be there, but he has somebody else come and read it to the king. And it's wintertime. We're in Jerusalem, which is up in the mountains, so it's cold, so there's a fire. And the king's having the, the, the word read. And here's what happens. Let me, let me show you what happens. This is Jeremiah 36. It says, each time the guy finished reading three or four columns from the scroll of the word of God, the king took a knife and cut off that section of the th scroll, and then he threw it into the fire section by section until the whole scroll was burned up. That's kind of the opposite of a listening heart, isn't it? Instead of listening to what God wants, you actually take God's word and you throw it into the fire. And I, I guess I don't need to say that, you know, because he pursued foolishness. Look, pursuing the wisdom of God leads to life. Pursuing foolishness leads to destruction. And this king was later hauled off in chains by the kingdom of Babylon and ended up in slavery. And pretty quickly after that, the whole nation was destroyed. Because he didn't have a listening heart. And I guess, you know, the question that we all have to, 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 to answer is, do you know your purpose? Do you, do you know what life is about? That you were created in the image of God, that God means to be in relationship with you, that he means to shine forth his goodness and joy and beauty through you. And because of that, he gives you an area of responsibility and an area where you have authority to carry out what you want. That area may just be in one little corner of the house or it may be a whole country. But you have a kingdom. And the question is, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to have a listening heart? Listen to the wisdom of God. Humble yourself. And follow his instructions. Read from his word daily. Learn what he wants. Or are you going to pursue your own way and basically cut his word up and throw it into the fire? Each person has to answer that question for him or herself. Amen.